seven, here are the numbers. Two, three, five, three, one, six, one, two, four, five, ten, three, four, and five. Cross-reference is 226, 4, 6, and 2 John 7. In uh, 229, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Commentary interaction. The false teachers, tools of Satan, the arch deceiver, were seeking to lead them astray, not only theologically in 226, but morally as well. That's from Stott. As John had already indicated, a key purpose of his letter was so that joy may be completed or full. He also wrote to his audience to warn them about those who would lead them astray in 226. Stott explains that the heretics appear to have indulged in a subtly perverse reasoning that somehow you could be righteous without necessarily bothering to practice righteousness. John roundly denies the possibility. Regarding this verse, Lou does not feel that John is referring to sin. She states, sin is not the author's real concern. If John is seeking to not have the under deceivers of Satan deceive and lead astray his spiritual dear children, he strongly warns them regarding righteous behavior that is evident of being like Christ. He then discusses the essence of righteous behavior in verses 8 and 9, mentioning specifically the topic of sin and then the distinction between the children of God and of Satan in verse 10. My final translation, children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Who's the he? Christ. Christ and not God? Well, both. <laughs> <laughs> the Trinity? <laughs> I, I'm just uh, wondering if you had thought about that, or did, do, do you think it matters that much? Well, he is referring here to God. Yeah, I don't know if it really matters. What do you think? Yeah, right. <laughs> I knew it would come to that. <laughs> well, you remember earlier in the week, it, uh, Stott pointed out that often in 1 John, a kainos, when it's used, refers to Jesus. Um, so this is where the context doesn't help you very much, because I think if you start going up line by line, it's a long time since we've had an explicit reference to either God or, 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 or Christ. Um, so I'd probably lean a little bit more towards Christ, but I, I'd, I'd translate it he, and then see if anybody asks me about it. <laughs> could be. Could be emphatic. Well, with the Akinos, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put himself. I mean, literally, it's that one. I mean, literally, that's what it, it says, just as that one is righteous. And when you put it that way, then, you know, you'd want to do what Stott claims to have done. He's claimed to look up all the Akanasas, <laughs> look, look at every time it's used and see if, if it, you do need to privilege it, kind of, it's a designator for, for, for Christ. Okay, on the grounded insight... As Christians, Satan does continue to try to deceive us and have other people try to lead us astray from biblical truth. However, the person that generally loves Jesus keeps his commandments. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. How we behave as Christians is important. The Christian does not seek to step out of the bounds of righteousness and thus into the darkness out of fellowship with the light. 1 John 1, 6-7. Because the warning here indicates that a believer may be deceived, led astray, as in let no one deceive you, it is critical to be on guard against the deception. 
Light is a preventative measure as to know the commandments of Jesus is vital to being in that light through knowing scripture. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay, next verse. Okay, sweating away. Okay, three, eight, here are the numbers. One, six, one, two, nine, one, two, five, ten, nine, two, one, two, five, nine, three, five, one, two, one, two, ten, five, one, two, one, two. On the cross reference, John 8, 34 and 8, 44, 1 John 3, 9, and then 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you uh, these things, writing of the same type of things and in instruction? On the commentaries. The challenge to allegiance becomes an uncompromising statement whose backdrop is the relentant, relentless antagonism between God and the devil. By the first century, the idea of the forces of opposition to God being embodied in or under the leadership of an arch opponent was a familiar one, and that's from Lou. Meaning that Lou views the issue as a battle of good against an evil. She comments, what could be told as the story of two battle lines confronting each other and stretching through, the, through time and humanity has been interrupted? This interruption, she explains, is the intervention of a new figure, the Son of God. Furthermore, Lou comments that the attempts to explain how such disobedience could emerge within God's good creation, something Genesis fails to do, struggle between affirming human free will and propensity to wrong and casting the blame on the primeval act of rebellion against God by an evil or fallen angel who could easily be merged with the devil. Such views influenced perhaps by Persian dualism pushed the conflict between good and evil onto the metaphysical or cosmic state. Lou appears to not have a strong belief in an actual being known as Satan who opposes God. More so, however, is his wrong attribution to the fall of humans solely to the deception by Satan. While Satan is influential in the temptation, James 1, 14 through 15 teaches that an individual's own desire is the cause of the real temptation and sin. Furthermore, Genesis teaches that while Satan was influential in the temptation of mankind, it was ultimately mankind's own rebellion that led to the sin. It was the rejection of God's word and lack of obedience to it that resulted in the fall of humanity. This is the same warning John provides in 1 John related to righteousness. As the previous verse indicated that one practicing righteousness is just like Christ. There is a clear distinction between the work of Satan and that of Christ. Stott comments, if the characteristic work of the devil is to sin, the characteristic work of the Son of God is to save. If then the whole purpose of Christ's first appearing was to remove sins and to undo the works of the devil, Christians must not compromise with either sin or the devil or they will find themselves fighting against Christ. Stott concludes this thought saying sin is incom incompatible with Christ in a sinless person and saving work. Final translation, he who practice, practices sin is of the devil because the devil is a sinner from the beginning. For this reason, the Son of God was revealed to destroy the work of the devil. On the grounded insight, a genuine believer in fellowship with God will do all they can to not sin. Sin is completely contrary to the person and work of Christ. If a person truly loves Jesus for his work of salvation, 
they will not be able to practice sin because it goes against the very work Christ died to destroy and set believers free from. Therefore, if a person is continuously in sin, it is evidence that they are not of God, but of the devil. Okay, we'll have you do the numbers and the cross references on the next verse. And then, at that point, we'll call up um, Matthew. Quilala, are you here? Okay, then you'll take over from there. Okay, right? three, nine. Numbers. Four, one, six, nine, one, two, two, eleven, five, ten, two, three, nine, three, five, ten, eleven, five, seven, ten, nine, one, two, five. The cross references, 1 John 5, 18, Matthew 7, 18, and Matthew 13, 37, along with 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Okay, thank you. You gonna do the commentary interaction? The concept of not able to sin does not refer to Christians being incapable of sinning. Rather, characteristic of Christians are that they do not continue to sin and that they cannot go on sinning. Scott. John does not deny the possibility of sin from Christians. The seed can be translated offspring. The reason that those who are born of God cannot continue in sin is due to the reality that they have become their very offspring of God. For my final translation, I have, all who are born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and is not able to sin, for he is born of God. For the grounded insight, the children of God are marked with a life that cannot continue to sin since they've inherited the righteous nature of God. And that's taking uh, seed the way that you're taking it. It's something from God that's implanted in us. Another way to take it uh, is his seed remain in him. It's another way you can take it. In other words, it's not seed referring to God's word or, or something that goes into our souls, but that word sperma there refers, it's sort of like the children of God. And then I explain that in my commentary. Uh, so that then you're going to explain that a little bit differently than the way you're explaining it here. But, you know, that's two major ways to take it. Next verse. What I have is nine, three, two. Hold it, Vanara. We got a different number. Oh. Four. Four. Evident. Obvious. Revealed. Five, one, two, one, two, ten. One, two, one, two, four, one, eight, six, two, eight, five, nine, one, two, ten, one, eight, six, one, two, and three. Okay, cross references. All right, I have First John two twenty nine and John chapter eight verse forty seven. If you know uh, from verse uh, chapter two verse twenty nine of First John, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also 
also who practices righteousness is born of him. And so you see that there is a relationship of how one lives with a connection to God. <clears throat> Commentary interaction. There are only two groups a person can be in, and it's, it is recognizable. We are either children of God or children of the devil. Children of the devil are marked out by a lack of righteousness and love. Final translation. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are evident. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, and the one who does not love his brother. And so for the grounded insight, God's children practice righteous living and a love for the brethren. It is what one practices, either sin or righteousness, that distinguishes whether or not they have a relationship with God or are still bound to the devil. It's not the only thing that distinguishes them, but it is something that distinguishes them. There are other ways that one could prove to be bound to the devil. You could have circumspect, circumspect behavior and still be bound to the devil. At least pretty good behavior. Okay, next uh, let's give some uh, applause to these presenters. I know that's what you're living for in this class, is to hear that popular acclaim. You have one more verse? Oh, okay. Matt one more verse. okay, Matt, go ahead. <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard of throwing under the bus. <laughs> Love for the brother. All right, 11, verse 11. What I have here is 10. Three, five, one, two, nine, five, nine, two, ten, five, three. Eight. Eight is three, yes, relative pronoun. pronoun so three. Is that one you're All right, for the cross-reference analysis, I have 1 John 1, 5. Uh, what we, can, uh, we can see those, and we can see the title. Why don't we just go right to the commentary? Okay. Commentary interaction. The heretics boasted of their new teaching, yet John declares that the truth was what they have heard from the beginning. It is the unchanging gospel of which to love one another um, of which to love one another is an essential part of it. For the final translation, for this is the truth which you heard from the beginning, that we love, that we might love one another. That's the truth. Oh. I'm not, I, I'm just, uh, what uh, text did you <laughs> translate? Yeah, message. Can, can I? Okay. It was uh, truth at 3 a.m. Truth at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a textual variant there. Uh, there Angelia is what Nessie Alant read, but um, other translations read promise. In fact, if you look at the textual apparatus, almost all manuscripts say promise. There are only one, two, three, four, only, well, that's not true. Four plus the majority say message. So I guess message is pretty strong. Message or promise? Okay, grounded insight. The message of the gospel will never change, remaining the same as it was proclaimed from the beginning by the apostles. And likewise, those who have genuinely trusted upon Christ 
and have received this message, I have a message there, should result in a life that loves others. All right, thank you. All right, chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> 8, 10, 2, 9, 1, 4 dash 2, 5, 10, 5, 1, 2, 3, 10, 9, 3, 5, 3, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4. You, know, you, you won the lottery. I, I don't think I ever saw a one, two, three, four, five before. It's, it's like a royal flush or something like that. I don't know what a royal flush is. I just. But. I think the Hari needs to be an eight as an adverb. I think he labeled it as a preposition. Which one is a tricky one? Which, which one? It's Can you point point to it? Oh, Haren. I had to look that one up. Uh, uh, Vida, I would call it a, a preposition. It, it is a preposition. It's an improper preposition. So it can fool you, because morphologically it looks like a form of a noun, but it's actually a preposition. And that it's uh, the proof of it is the tenos that comes after it. So you, you just find it; it's a different lexical entry. By the way, note it almost always uh, comes after the word it governs. I think Ephesians three, verse one or two has. In fact, it might be the first two words of Ephesians three uh, has the same construction, but they flip the object and the preposition. So usually, uh, usually the preposition comes at the end of the prepositional phrase with this word. It's very strange. OK, cross references. Cross references, Genesis 4, 8. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. This verse provides the background reference for the first part of 312, 312a. Usually the focus is on Abel, the righteous, when you look at the New Testament. But in 3 verse 12, Abel is not even named. Cain is named as a negative example of a lack of love leading to murder. The other reference is Hebrews 11 verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. This verse is the mother load in the Nesleyvon text. It enhances our understanding of the righteous brother of Cain in the second half of 312, 312b. He was ultimately righteous because of faith, which evidenced itself in the offering of a better gift. Better okay. And just because I know not everybody's packing, uh, a Greek New Testament. This is what I was referring to in Ephesians 3 1. Tutu Haran. And Haran is a preposition meaning uh, on account of. So, on account of this, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. So, Tutu Haran. This is usually how Haran is used. It's a, a backwards prepositional construction. Commentary or grammar interaction? New states that Cain's murder is not the only point. Rather, the point is that Cain belonged to or had his origin in the evil one. The readers, however, already know that they or the youths have conquered the evil one, so they can be in no doubt where they stand. Thus, Cain is a prototype of one who is from the evil one, who does not love his brother. This lack of love ultimately leads to murder. John gives a negative example that those who do not act like Cain show they are truly of God. Therefore, love of the brethren is a way to tell that one has conquered the evil one. Conversely, lack of love for the brethren shows that one is of the evil one, just as Cain was. 
So she's relating it back to chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. <coughs> Final translation, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And for what reason did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Grounded inside, the antithesis of love is jealous hatred, ultimately leading to murder. I got that from Stott. Cain becomes a picture of a direct negation of true love, since 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 says, Love is not jealous, and 13, verse 6 says that love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. John uses Cain as a negative example of how jealousy arising out of a loveless heart is to be avoided by those who claim to be Christians. This relates to 3 verse 11 where love is seen to be inherent to the gospel message which they have heard from the beginning. Okay, why don't you run us through 3.13 and then we'll get your compatriot up. 3.13 11 slash 8 5, 2, 10, 5, 3, 1, 2. Cross-reference analysis. This is the mother load. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. The reason Christians should not be surprised that the world hates them is because the world hated Christ before it hated us. <clears throat> Commentary of grammar and of action. Stott says, the world is Cain's posterity, so we are not to be surprised if the world hates us. It is only to be expected that the wicked should continue to regard and treat the righteous as Cain regarded and treated his righteous brother Abel. This is the connection between verses 12 and 13. Cain correlates with the world, and Abel correlates with the brethren. Lou supports this idea when she says, the world takes the place of Cain, we, who are brothers, take the place of his brother. Therefore, since the world hates us, present active, as Cain hated Abel, this implies that believers' deeds are righteous, just as Abel's were righteous. Final translation, do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. Grounded insight, John gives this command to not marvel or be surprised if the world hates Christians. By not giving the reason for their hatred, he points back to Abel's righteous deeds, which caused Cain to be evil. John makes clear that Cain and Abel were obviously very different from one another in morality and love. Therefore, true Christians living righteously should expect opposition from the world. On the other hand, if a professing Christian continually lives so much like the world that he blends in with it and thus never receives opposition for his profession of faith, this may be a reason to question that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> verse 14. Uh, we have numbers uh, 3, 5, 10, 5, 9, 1, 2, 9, 1, 2, 10, 5, 1, 2, 1, 8, Six, five, nine, one, two. <coughs> Cross harvest. And you can actually just read your observation because we can very quickly see the reference. So read your explanation of the reference. Okay. Uh, Translate twenty four the club. Uh, he has passed out of that into life in John uh, 5 24 is almost the same with that in 1 John 3 14. Only person and number of the verb are different. And because Jesus is, is describing a believer's condition uh, by the cloud in John 5 24, John here assumes that he and the readers are believers who are in that condition. Interestingly, while Jesus is saying how one can enter the condition, they still believe in Jesus Christ. John is here saying how one can manifest or show that he is in that condition, that is love for the brothers. And uh, 1 John 2.11, uh, here we have a parallel statement. 
the one who hates his brothers is in the darkness, and the one who does not love remains in death. Commentary in question. Hemes at the beginning of the verse is emphatic, which implies an adversity of ideas. And Lu suggests uh, the author may, uh, may not have wanted to decide whether their love for their brothers is the ground for their certain knowledge or for their having made a trend, uh, transition, both of which are grammatically possible. Uh, the latter option is not. Uh, it's only grammatically, not theologically possible because it, it implies a doctrine of salvation by words. Uh, Stud rightly states, love is the short, short test of having life. And it has already been shown to be the test of being in your life. And my final translation is, uh, uh, we ourselves know that we have passed up of death and life because we love our brothers. The uh, one who does not love still remains in the death. Inside, uh, one of the purpose of uh, First John is to give assurance to the readers that they have eternal life. Here in uh, 314, John directly gives the assurance. You can be sure of your salvation because you love your brothers. He does not use the conditional plug if, but the other plug because. He does not ask the readers whether they love their brothers, whether he assumes so. He's trying to give the, uh, the readers an assurance, not a test. While we sometimes need to say like Paul in 2 Corinthians 35, test yourself to see if you have the faith. There, there's a time when we should say like John. So I guess he really told, he told Stott, didn't he? <laughs> Stott says the test and he says it's an assurance, it's not a test. So, good. Think for yourself. 315. Last verse before lunch. Okay, 4, 1, 6, 1, 2, 3, 2, 5, 10, 5, 10, 4, 2, 11, 5, Two, four, nine, three, six. Cross references. Hold it. He's, we got. It. Okay. Enter <coughs> the first one. It should be four. Well, it would be a four dash two then. Did you look it up and find it to be an adjective? Yeah. Okay. So both of your anthropoctanos. The second one is more than that. First one. Um, everyone who hates his brother is a homicide, a, a man killer. So that the question is, when you look it up, is it an adjective or a noun? First one, did I have it as a noun? Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're both nouns. Okay. Yeah, we'll call them twos. Cross-reference. Uh, John 8.4, the Greek word for mother is used only in John 8.4 and 1 John 3.15 in the NT. And Jesus used it to refer to the devil in, in whom there is no truth. And John here used it to refer to anyone who hates his brothers who does not have eternal life. The context of John uh, 44 is notable. Uh, they are, the Jews insist that they are the sons of Abraham and their father is God. Jesus does not agree with them because what they do denies what they speak. If their com confession were true, they would love Jesus as, as Abraham did. However, what they want to do is to kill him. Uh, this is what the devil wants to do. So the Jews' hatred of Jesus proves that their father is not God, but the devil. In this sense, we can, uh, 
we can understand the second part of first uh, 2016. If anyone does, uh, if anyone does what the world does, he is still of the world, so that he does not have uh, have eternal life. And there are three more cross references here. Uh, a commentary connection. Uh, for 16 is the proof treatment of the previous point that lack of love is the evidence of spiritual death. Start, said that, and start understand where this was as a general uh, principle of action. For Lu is also right as he said, there's uh, there's for this also no middle ground between hatred and love, between death and life. Uh, it may be a general principle that uh, has some exceptions, but he also does not imply any exception here, whether he uses it as an absolute principle. The, patch, the question such as what kind of love it, it is or how should we love are not in, an issue here. The question is, do you love your brother or do you hate him? The final translation, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life that is abiding in him. I just want to underscore your reference to Matthew 5, which is surely the Sermon on the Mount passage where Jesus likens just expressing contempt for a brother as murder. That's a very important background for, you know, for this kind of rhetoric. Jesus engaged in it too. For Christians, there, are, uh, there may be a time when our heart condemns us because we think we do not love enough. Yet it does not matter because our God is greater than our heart and knows all things, including our mind, will, and body. Uh, he said in verse 20. However, verse 15 should be uh, applied to non-Christians. When the issue is spiritual salvation right here, you are either a lover or a murderer either in life or in death, either of God or of the devil. Where do you identify yourself? You know, the soul of us, it says you're not supposed to be preaching here. <laughs> but he got, he got a zinger in there, didn't he? Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll have one of you guys finish tomorrow, both of you. Very good work.